Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. This is part five of a six part bonus series on the hearing loss treatment journey. Coming up. This episode is sponsored by Natus, formerly Otometrics, the preferred diagnostic equipment supplier of the Dr. Cliff Show. Since the 1950s, Otometrics has been one of the most innovative manufacturers of hearing aid fitting equipment and diagnostic hearing and balance equipment in the industry. When it comes to testing and treating our patients, we only want to work with the best. This is why we use Natus in our clinic. Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. I'm Cliff Olson, doctor of audiology and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am joined with my co-host. Hello, everybody. My name is Rachel Cook. I'm also an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us as we proceed on with our Natus bonus six-part series covering the patient journey and best practices. So over the last four episodes, we started out by assessing the outer ear using the Otocam 300. We then moved into assessing the middle ear using the Madsen Zodiac tympanometer. And then in our third episode, we were talking about the inner ear and hearing tests and assessments using the Astera 2 audiometer and taking all of those results and integrating them into OtoSuite. And then last episode was pretty fun. We were talking about ear molds and custom hearing aids and how to get those created through OtoScans. So if you haven't watched any of those episodes yet, make sure you go back and watch them first. They really lay the framework for these episodes. Um, and then in today's episode, we're gonna be talking about hearing aid quality control. And for that, we're gonna be talking as well about hearing aid diagnostics and what all goes into those diagnostics using the Oracle Hitbox. So make sure if you haven't already, like and subscribe so you don't miss any other part of this series. All right, thank you. So we uh, talked about the Hitbox today. When we say Hitbox, we mean Hearing Instrument Test Box. We actually have one of those on our desk here this morning for you guys to look and see. We're gonna have other graphics that we'll put up during the show, uh, so make sure that you check those out as well. But when you start thinking about hearing aids, there you have to make sure that those hearing aids are mechanically functioning the right way. And if we don't make sure that they're functioning the right way before we fit someone with them, we could be fitting someone with a hearing aid that is not working. Right. So we just spent all of this time finding out exactly what the right devices were for the patient, got them ordered, potentially used the OtoScan to do custom impressions of their ears and get like the perfect hearing aid for them. But then when it comes into the clinic, we've got to make sure that that hearing aid is functioning the right way. So we call this running diagnostics. We call it doing electroacoustic analysis or EAAs for short. When we're in the clinic, that's more of like an audiologic term yeah. there. But when you think about running diagnostics, on hearing aids specifically, every single hearing aid manufacturer has a certain specification sheet mm -hmm. um, that they will send off uh, with their hearing aids that we'll show you guys here in a little bit as well. And we have to make sure that hearing aids are falling within the specification ranges uh, of those particular spec sheets. And when you think about this in other industries, there are other industries that have certain specifications that have to be met. So like when you take your car into the mechanic, they will hook your car up to a computer and run diagnostics on the car to see, okay, what part of the car is malfunctioning so we can go ahead and fix that. You can find that with cell phones. Of course, you find that with computers as well. So there's a, there's a lot of different um, you know, industries, particularly in electronics, that you have to be able to make sure that those devices are functioning the right way. Right, otherwise, like you said, we spend all of this time and work and effort and energy to get the perfect hearing aid, but if it's not meeting manufacturer specifications, then it's not gonna work well for you. So there, uh, we've got a graphic here of what the hitbox looks like. I know we've got the one in front of us, but that's what it looks like when the instrument is actually in there, just to give you a little bit of context. And there are several times that these measures are run. And so initially when the devices come in from the manufacturer, we have to run test box measures on them because although when they left the factory, they were meeting manufacturer specifications, sometimes even in travel, things can get shifted around and maybe these devices now are not meeting specifications. Um, and another moment that we do test box measures on uh, hearing instruments is when they return from repair. 
And so uh, even though we're sending them to the manufacturer to be repaired, sometimes they don't always return from the manufacturer repaired. Have you ever had one of those experiences in the clinic? All the time. In yeah. fact, you know, we've had a couple, it seems, within the past several weeks. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to talk about how often these devices come back and they're not actually working the right way. Um, but, you know, there's this expectation that when you send a hearing aid to a manufacturer that they're just going to fix it, the problem will be solved, you get it back, you can just fit it right back on your patient. But um, it only takes one time for you to fit a hearing aid that has been quote unquote repaired, mm -hmm. that is still not functioning the right way and fit it on a patient and have them be like, there's something not right here, yeah. when we could have identified that beforehand. Right, right, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Now, we also run test box measures with pretty specific patient reports. And so oftentimes if a patient comes in and they are, um, reporting something that maybe potentially I can't even hear with my own ears, right? Because I do have normal hearing. I don't know necessarily what it's supposed to sound like for them. I'll do a listening check of it and maybe I can't pick up on exactly what they're expressing. So we'll put it into test box and then boom, right away we can see, oh, you know what? You're right. It's not it's not operating the way that it's supposed to be operating here. That's the thing. A lot of hearing is subjective. And so we have our own subjective perception on what something would sound like. And there's times where we listen to a hearing aid and like, that doesn't sound good to me. We run it through the test box and nope, everything is fine. Yep. That's just what the patient needs to hear to compensate for right. their unique hearing loss. Right, right. Now we're also doing this, uh, at least in our clinic, we're doing this annually. And we definitely recommend that this test be run annually. Um, we adhere to the belief that proactive maintenance is much better than reactive maintenance and catching these problems and issues, you know, sometimes even before the patient does. I actually had this experience twice this week, two back-to-back follow-up appointments at their annual, and we were doing these test box measures on their devices. And both of them, both for each of these patients, their hearing aid did not pass specs. And even though they came in and they sat down and they had said, everything sounds wonderful, and then I run them through and I go, oh, mm, not wonderful. I go back in and I say, if you had to guess, did you think maybe one of them? And they guessed correctly. Both of them did. That's so interesting. It's that they, they knew something was off, but they couldn't say what it was. And so they said, oh, I think for the most part, everything's fine. But once we run diagnostics, it's not. Well, that's the thing. A lot of times with hearing aids, they fall out of specification range so gradually that it's almost like you're convincing yourself that that's just how it should be sounding. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually go and you, you clear that up, you get it fixed, replace a receiver wire, send it to the manufacturer, whatever you have to do to fix that problem, you put it back in their ears and like, oh yeah, that's a huge difference. Oh. Definitely. But, but that's the that's the insidious nature of what happens with hearing. I mean, hearing tends to decline over the course of time. You might not notice it until it, you have a breaking point. And then it's the same thing with diagnostics on a hearing aids. The hearing aids could be gradually falling out of spec range. And unless you catch it ahead of time, like proactively, um, you're, they're going to be going through three, six, 12 months with a hearing aid that's just going to be getting worse and worse over the course of time. Definitely. So I, my recommendation would be if to, to any patient, if you go in and you're expressing that you don't think that you're hearing um, as well as you were before. I think we hear that sentence sometimes. I'm not exactly sure if I'm hearing as well as I should be. And you have the hearing test done and the hearing test, uh, your hearing thresholds have not changed at all. Then at that point, it, it is most definitely time for us to take a look at the hearing aid itself to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, individuals who are having their hearing loss treated, they make an assumption that, um, you know, there might not be answers to these things, but I am of the belief that if you're experiencing a problem, there is a reason why we just have to find out exactly what that is. Yep. And oftentimes without running test box measures, we're not able to identify a really big chunk of that variable, which is the performance of the hearing aid itself. Right, absolutely. Now we were talking earlier about getting some of these hearing aids from the manufacturer and back from repair and having them not be within specifications as soon as we get them. Um, and so we know that in our clinic, uh, we see numbers between 25 and 30% of the hearing aids that come in new or from uh, return from repair are not meeting manufacturer specifications. And that's a huge amount of hearing aids. So this blows my mind because that means about a quarter to a third of hearing aids that are being worn by individuals are not functioning the right way. And I don't care if everything else was done exactly the right way, those hearing aids are not going to work 
the right way. And the other thing that really blows my mind about this is how few hearing care professionals actually run these diagnostic tests. I think that historically, a lot of providers have been like, oh, you know, I can trust those hearing aids when they come in from the manufacturer, but they're not considering that those devices have to go through transit and they get banged around inside of whatever the shipping container is that they are in. And then by the time they arrive at your clinic, they may not actually be functioning the right way. And they're willingly dispensing these products to their patients. And I just think that if more hearing care professionals were aware of these particular numbers that we're seeing in our clinic of 25 to 35% of hearing aids are not meeting manufacturer specifications, I think that a lot more would actually be doing them. And we talk about best practices a lot. It is considered best practice to test these hearing aids every single time they come back from the manufacturer and land inside of your clinic. Yeah, and to some that might be considered overkill, but I think it's really important to know that there are some times or some um, reports from patients that when we listen to the hearing aids themselves, we can tell right away that something's wrong, right? But there's no, for some of these, there are very slight differences. They're nearly imperceptible, especially if it's not your hearing aids and it's not your hearing loss. So to get the hearing aids in from the manufacturer and to take a quick listen to them really tells you nothing about the actual performance of the devices. Now doing this testing is very technical, but it doesn't take an immense amount of time. No. I mean, you know, if you have, you know, 10 patients in a day and you have to run measures on all 10, yes, that's going to take some time. But I think that making sure that we have enough support staff in the office to make right. sure that we get this done, our patients are worth it at the oh, end of the definitely. day to make sure that we do things in the right way. And this is one of those things that if I had to beg hearing care professionals to start using a piece of equipment, it would be a piece of equipment like the hearing instrument test box from this. Yeah, absolutely. So let's take a look at that, um, the graphic of the test box again, because I'd like to kind of explain some of the things that we see here. So this is with the test box open. You can see in the back there, there's a pretty large speaker. And above that speaker, there is a bendable reference microphone. And so that microphone is able to bend into any position in any shape. But where we're lining that up is actually right at the microphone of the actual instrument itself. And that microphone is going to be recording what exactly what's coming from the speaker and then lining that information up with what's coming out of the hearing aid. So you see the hearing aid below, and then you see there's this putty there as well. And so what we do is we wrap this putty around the, the speaker or the opening of the hearing aid, and then that is being recorded through that silver tube there in the middle, and then comparing the data from the reference microphone measurement to what's actually coming out of the device. Yeah, so basically we're putting a calibrated signal through the hearing aid and we're measuring what the output of that signal is on the other end and we would expect because it's all calibrated mm -hmm. we would expect to get very specific measures within a certain tolerance range right and if we do not find the hearing aids to be within that tolerance range then it has failed the diagnostics um, if it does come in and everything's like okay all of these numbers line up with what we would expect when we're putting this type of signal through the hearing aid that means that the hearing aid has passed and it is okay to be fit on a patient and it will sound fantastic as long as it's programmed the right way right right so let's take a look at what we are actually testing with the test box. So every single hearing aid from the manufacturer has a data sheet or a tech sheet or a manufacturer spec sheet that comes with it. And that's basically telling you, here's what the performance limits for this hearing aid should be. When all is well and the device is functioning as it should be, these are the numbers and the values that, that, that we should get. And so we've got an example of one overall and I guess go ahead and walk us through this briefly. Yeah, so to the lay person, this can be uh, somewhat confusing. Yeah. So uh, again, every single hearing aid has one of these that goes along with it. And on the sheet that we have up there on the screen, it's for a very particular make and model. This just happens to be a Phonak hearing aid. And then we have different power of receivers as well. So on the left-hand side of this sheet, you have the power receiver. On the far right-hand side, you have the ultra power receiver. And both of those would give you different numbers. And so there's a ton of numbers on here. Let's zoom in here a little bit into this graphic to give you a little bit more precise understanding of what we're looking at here. So starting at the very top, we have output sound pressure level. We call this OSPL. And for this particular hearing aid, we can see that we have a maximum of 132 decibel 
uh, dB SPL, and then the high frequency average of the output is 124 dB SPL. So for this particularly, we want to make sure that this hearing aid is falling within a tolerance range of these particular numbers, and if we're falling significantly outside of that, then we've got a problem here. But then we can move down here to acoustic gain. This right here shows us how much amplification can be added to an incoming signal on this particular hearing aid. So you have a maximum of 71 decibels of gain, and then a high frequency average, which is an average of several different frequencies, comes out to 65 dB. And again, if the hearing aid itself, that you, when you actually run the hearing aid through the test box, if we're coming out within a tolerance of these numbers, then we're looking really good. So the one that most people will probably understand better is this idea of distortion. So when we look at the distortion graphic here, uh, we can see that there are four different measures of distortion. We have 500 hertz, 800 hertz, 1600 hertz, and 3200 hertz. And we want these distortion numbers to be low because think about it, if you have high distortion of sound in the hearing aid, it's basically telling you that that sound's not going to be clear. And we want the signal to be as clear as humanly possible. So again, we do not want these distortion numbers to be too high. If they are and they fall outside of the tolerance range that we're looking for that specific hearing aid, then that hearing aid did not meet manufacturer specifications. And then the last one that we really want to drill home here is the equivalent input noise. So for every hearing aid, there's a certain amount of noise that's just inherently generated by that hearing aid being turned on. And in the it, it, think of it like a car, like you turn your car on, but you don't rev your engine, you just turn it on and let it run. There's a hum that comes with the engine just being turned on. Right. That's a very similar characteristic to a hearing aid. The hearing aid is a computer, you turn it on, it's going to have some amount of sound that it creates just to be turned on and functioning. And you do not want that, that level of noise to be too high. This particular hearing aid spec sheet indicates that right around 19 decibels in sound pressure level, that you do not want the hearing aid to be falling significantly outside of that tolerance range. So those are the specific things that we are actually looking for when we're running diagnostics on a hearing aid that comes in from the manufacturer. But there are several other things that we can identify using a test box as well. Definitely. So another measure that we can look at is directionality. So most digital hearing aids on the market, just depending on their size and their style, come with directional microphones. And these microphones are used to try to basically allow the hearing aids to focus in on certain areas of your environment rather than picking up everything from all directions at the same time. And so you, we can also test to make sure that the directionality of the microphones is enabled and working and that it's going the right way. Uh, we recently had a meeting with one of your hearing up providers who mentioned that oftentimes she, she has run into hearing aids where the directional microphones that are supposed to be facing forward are actually facing backward. Um, and so that would result in some pretty poor outcomes there for sure. Well, yeah, because now you're in a noisy restaurant and you're hearing the noisy table behind yeah. you and not the person in front of you. And I do have to give a shout out to Natus here because inside of the Oracle Hitbox, they have a way where you can actually play with a back speaker at the same time as the front speaker. So a lot of other test box out there, um, you actually have to run a front measure, flip, open up the test box, flip the hearing aid around, and then rerun it. And with them, you don't. You just leave the hearing aid in there, you specify that you're doing a directionality test, and it does it automatically for you. So again, it cuts down on the time. We're not making patients wait an immense amount of time for trying to figure out if directionality is working on their devices. Yeah, yeah, super easy. Now we can also look at the noise reduction settings of the hearing aids as well in, in specific programs and just overall. Um, also telecoil settings too. So if you have a telecoil enabled device, which we haven't necessarily jumped into in this series, but some hearing aids do have a telecoil within them. This telecoil allows them to connect to public looped systems um, and it's a, a programming setting on their hearing aid. And this allows us to verify that the settings there are also doing what they should be doing. Yeah, and it's really cool. I have a, a good friend of mine who also installs hearing loops inside of public venues. And he has a set of hearing aids that he uses to go to these venues that he's done installations in so he can listen to them himself. But he's like, Cliff, it always sounds like garbage to me. Why is that the case? Well, I ended up taking his devices checking out the telecoil and how the telecoil was actually set up and programmed. And I was able to make programming adjustments 
of those particular devices for the telecoil program and now he can use those devices and it sounds great when he nice. goes into these venues so a lot of this stuff has it's not just like a nice to have a lot of this stuff has a lot of utility to it you just have to unlock the capabilities of the hearing instrument test box right a lot of value and another one that's extremely important especially for users that use the zinc air batteries or disposable batteries is that we can actually test the battery drain of the device and so we're able to remove the disposable battery and we put in this it's called a little battery pill that we place into the hearing aid and we can actually test how much current is being drawn from the devices so if you are saying consistently over and over i'm supposed to be getting four or five days of use out of this battery and i'm getting two what's going on well on the one hand we need to look at your usage and see if if that lines up with the reduced battery life but if it doesn't, uh, then we need to test the battery drain in that moment. Yeah, and it's really nice to be able to have an objective measure of this rather than saying, ah, well, I guess we could just send it into the yeah. manufacturer and tell them that there's a problem. Right. But again, there's no guarantee that that's gonna get fixed even if you do send it in. So if you have a hearing aid spec sheet that says you should be drawing 1.9 milliamps per hour, and then you end up running the hearing aid through that and identify you're pulling twice that, well, that just means that you're getting half the amount of battery life out of every single battery that you're using. And until right. you get that problem fixed, you're, it's not the batteries. It ends up being the hearing aid itself, but we wouldn't know. Yeah. You might make the assumption, oh, you just got a bad pack of batteries. And that really was not the case. Right, right. So super important to really look at these things objectively, right? So we've got this idea of subjective and your opinion base when we're listening. Um, trying to say, okay, this sounds good to me, or does it sound good to you? Really, is it sounding the way it is supposed to be sounding, and is it functioning the way it is supposed to be functioning? That's the true question. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, we do have some um, pass and fails that we're going to show you guys. Yeah. I think it's important that you understand what we're looking at. Again, this stuff can be pretty technical, so if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, then that just means you need to make sure that you find a hearing care professional who is using this equipment Most so definitely. they can do that for you, okay? But I always think it's good for you to have a general understanding of what we want to actually find inside of a hearing aid and this might be setting off some alarm bells inside of your head because if you're worried that you're actually not getting the amount of sound that you think that you should or the quality of sound that you think that you should you need to ask your hearing care professional to be running test box measures on your devices so let's go ahead and jump in we've got two different hearing aids here that we're going to look at one of them was an ultra power hearing aid that did not meet manufacturer specifications uh, and then another one that did actually i think i flip-flopped those i think we're going to be looking at an ultra power that that did pass did correct pass, yes so let's jump into that let's put up the the passing graphic so this is actually what we look at as hearing care professionals when we've run the hearing aid through this box and then the numbers that we're looking at here is what we're comparing to those spec sheets that we showed you a little bit earlier so when we run through this we're going to look at the ospl 90 numbers this is the output sound pressure level and we can kind of mark those off here for you so we generally want to see these numbers like i said falling within a certain tolerance range of the spec sheet that we had. And in this particular case, for this specific hearing aid that we looked at, these numbers were in within that tolerance range. Then when we move from the output, so the, the output is how loud the hearing aid can amplify to, we then move on to the full on gain. So this is how much amplification or gain can be added to an incoming signal. And again, this particular device had certain numbers that we were trying to achieve and all of these numbers here were falling within this as well. So that is looking fantastic. Then when we move down, we can see that we have total harmonic distortion. So these are the distortion percentages that we were talking about. We have really low distortion here, which is absolutely fantastic. So for this particular hearing aid, the sound that's coming through is very clean, and that is exactly what we want to see. Um, then we have equivalent input noise. So again, every single hearing aid that we look at has a different amount of allowable noise. When you start looking at an ultra power hearing aid, we would expect the amount of noise that that hearing aid generates to be turned on and functioning to be a little bit higher. And if it is, then that's okay as long as it's follow, falling inside of those specification ranges. So we can see, you know, uh, I would say higher than normal equivalent input noise for a standard hearing aid, but for an ultra power hearing aid, we're looking really good here. So that right there is a terrific example of a hearing aid that is passing manufacturer specifications. And if we see one of those hearing aids come into the clinic, what are we telling the patient at that point? Oh, at that point, we know that the device has passed the specification tests that we're running 
it through. We know for certain that the device is ready to go and it's ready for your hearing aid fitting at that point. Absolutely, but not every single hearing aid happens to come in like that or come back from repair like that. Definitely not. And so we have an example of a different device that did not pass. Right. Now, just to be clear, we're using different specification data here, but take a look at this graphic. I mean, right away from the jump, we know that things are out of whack over here. So let's zoom in, starting at the top with the OSPL90 there. Um, again, these are different. The, this hearing aid uses a different set of specifications, but I can tell you right away that this is not meeting the output standards that it should be meeting. If we move down to the full on gain, uh, this just makes me chuckle. Uh, we can see that that top value there is 9.8. That should be clocking in for this hearing aid around 47, 48, something along those lines. So when you're getting nine, what does that mean when you're getting nine in this in this value? It means that the hearing aid might actually be making your hearing worse mm -hmm. while you're wearing it because it's probably actually cutting down on sound for you to some degree. Yeah, definitely. Now then we get into some really crazy stuff here when we move into distortion. Um, these values are supposed to be kind of, I mean, generally below 4% or so. If we can get it below 2% or so, that's even better. Uh, we are looking at 6% at 500 hertz, 8% at 800 hertz, and 11% at 1600 hertz. This is not going to result in a clean signal at all. And you'd be surprised at how many individuals can't even pick that up. Uh, but then when you get it fixed, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much cleaner sound. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then again, we're looking at that equivalent input noise. And for a standard hearing aid, that is well out of specifications. So. Overall, it's easy to see visually, um, but it's not always easy to see visually either. Sometimes we have the graphs that run, like the original curve, that they look clean, and then we look at the actual values, and they're, they're outside of the ranges. So again, the curve looks good to see the overall shape of it, but we still have to be comparing the actual numerical values with the numerical values that were supplied by the manufacturer. Now, there are some cases where, like if you're listening to that hearing aid, you might have picked up on the gain numbers being super low. Yeah. Because when we're doing this just by listening, we have like a listening scope that we, we put the hearing aid into and we talk into it and then we listen to what that output is. And sometimes you're like, yeah, something just doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem like mm -hmm. as much volume as I would expect by me talking into the hearing aid. And then if you're lucky, they have a hearing aid on the other side that's functioning better and you talk into that, like, oh, okay, that's what it should be sounding mm -hmm. like. So this one here we know is failing. Right. But then there's other times where you do a listening check and you're like, yeah, I mean, I think they sound pretty good, but we don't function based off of, I think so. No. We don't function based off of, I'm going to roll the dice and, and just make a, a guess here. It's, we need the objective data to prove to ourselves that what we're hearing is actually correct. Now, I know you have normal hearing. I do not have completely normal hearing. There's a lot of audiologists and hearing instrument specialists out there who do not have normal hearing. Yeah. So we can't really trust what we're hearing when we're just talking into these hearing aids at uncalibrated levels. No, definitely not. There's no way to listen to a hearing aid and know for certain that it is meeting specifications because we're testing so many different input levels at that point. So if you talk into a hearing aid and just do a quick listening check, well, the hearing aid, when we're running specification tests, we're testing at different levels across the board, soft inputs, loud inputs. I mean, there's so many things that are being assessed that you just, you just can't get done by doing a quick check and talking into it. Absolutely, you know, and when it comes to running test box measures, again, not a whole lot of individuals are running this inside of the clinic, which just boggles my mind because we start uncovering things all the time to where we're like, man, I could have swore that hearing aid was working the right way. I even ran it through real ear measurement. Now, um, we're gonna be talking about real ear measurement on the next episode of this bonus series, the final episode of this bonus series, which which is a hugely important part of making sure that a hearing aid is fit and programmed correctly. So make sure that you guys don't miss that episode. But even running that, so I think a lot of providers, I've, I've talked to so many providers about best practices, about using a hearing instrument test box like the, the Oracle Hit, and what they tell me is that like, well, Cliff, I'm doing really your measurements on the devices mm -hmm. and that's all coming out okay. So um, the hearing aid must be functioning the right way. And that's just not the case. You can't, you can't measure distortion no. in an output signal that you're measuring with real or measurement. You can't measure equivalent input noise. You're, you're really not testing out OSPL 90. I mean, maybe if you're running an MPO measure, but even then it, it's, it's not the same. It's, it's just, it's 
it's never going to be the same. You have to run test box measurements. You have to. Yeah. And, you know, even if you're not a data junkie, I mean, this stuff, once you start doing it a lot, it is not a foreign language that you're trying to read through. I know this no. is probably the first time that a lot of you guys are watching and seeing this type of stuff here. But if you break it down into simple chunks and simple, you know, a form, it's it's very easy to see if a hearing aid is falling within or without these specification ranges. And, you know, it's become such a critical component in our clinic that I don't know how I would function without it anymore. I would always have this little voice in the back of my head saying, are you sure that hearing aid is working mm -hmm. the right way? Because you're about to fit that patient with it. And you're you're about to charge them a couple thousand dollars for that particular device that you're fitting them with. Yeah. You sure you don't want to take 10 minutes to test it and make sure that it's working the right way? And I just, I don't think I could, you know, ethically and morally live with myself if I wasn't running every single hearing aid through a test box before fitting them. Right. And, it, and we look at other uh, medical fields as well. Um, let's say that they're prescribing a medication, right? They prescribe you a new medication. And then when they go back in, they just say, oh, how do you feel? Yeah, things going good? Okay. Okay, great. Patient says, should I maybe get some blood work done? Should we like check these values, make sure everything? Nah, you said it's good, so we're good, right? Yeah, imagine imagine <laughs> the, the, the pharmaceutical company when they're doing like compounding or whatnot, and yeah. they're not like actually verifying that they're uh, giving the right amount of drug inside of each pill right, the right that weight. they're giving you. They're just, they're just tapping some they're out onto a, a little, little <laughs> onto, you, you know, it's like, not yeah. using a scale, nothing yeah, like, like mad that. Just kind of kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, just winging it a little bit. There's no, there should be no winging anything in your healthcare treatment ever. Audiology, any other field, doesn't matter. There should be no best guesses. There should be no winging it. We have the way to test this. It exists. It's widely available, and it just needs to be utilized. And so. I know that there's a lot of smarter providers out there than you and I. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not you. Definitely me. I know that for a fact. But if they're not running these measures, they do not know. I don't care how smart you are or how good you think you are at hearing. You can't tell everything that's going on with the hearing aid just by listening to it. Now, the other thing that I love about the Oracle Hitbox is the ability to incorporate this with Otosuite. Now, we have talked about Otosuite for a variety of the different episodes that we did on this bonus series, you know, going all the way back from being able to store, um, you know, video footage inside of the ear canal using the, uh, the Otocam 300. And then you have the ability to store tympanometry data inside of Otosuite, audiometric data inside of Otosuite, and you can kind of pull it up all together so it's all in one cohesive place. And you had referenced earlier about, hey, we do a test box measure on a set of devices, and maybe we did that six or 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna rerun diagnostics again, but you know what, we wanna look and see what the measures were from right. six or 12 months ago. Otosuite lets us do that. Yep, we can go right back. And from a counseling perspective, because I know sometimes, you know, uh, repairs can get expensive, uh, not generally when in warranty, but out of warranty repairs can be tough. And so some patients will say, well, I think that I'm hearing okay. I don't really know if I want to send it in. I think everything's fine, right? Uh, but this gives us a really valuable tool to really show, no, you may think that it's fine, but sometimes the first time that we see you at a, at a hearing test appointment, you also think that your hearing overall is fine and we do a hearing test and we find out, no, there's actually a hearing loss there. These things happen so gradually most of the time um, that you don't notice that there's a significant reduction in performance. And so being able to demonstrate and show a visual map, show the numerical values and say, here's what it needs to be performing at, here's what it's actually performing at, most of the time people are, are re really, really responsive to that and so it just helps make that bond a little stronger between patient and provider and and helps with trust as well. Absolutely. More story time here. So literally yesterday and it, the funny thing is is that like we're not making this stuff up. Like we see this stuff all the time. All day long. All day long. Yeah. And so yesterday for me had a patient who's a snowbird because we practice here in Arizona, but we have a lot of patients who during the summer months, they want to get the heck out of Dodge. They want to go back to their more Northern or Midwestern states where the weather is a little bit more comfortable for them. And uh, had a patient come back after about 11 months of being gone because he was in Illinois, uh, my hometown is, or not my hometown, but my old stomping grounds there in Illinois and came back and he's like, yeah, things have been going well. Well, no complaints from me. We're like, okay, but we're going to put you through our annual platinum visit where we're going to do a hearing test on you. We're going to run diagnostics on the hearing aids, do maintenance on the hearing aids, and then run realer measurements if anything has changed with your prescription. 
And so we take both of the devices into the back, and uh, we were back there for quite some time because the left hearing aid was not passing specifications, and this is even after we did the cleaning and maintenance of it. Mm -hmm. So we bring it back into the room, and he puts both of the hearing aids back in. He's like, oh, these sound great. I'm like, okay, well, let's go through the diagnostics. Yeah. Now, um, you know this, I know this. There are certain individuals who could care less as a patient of what the numbers are. Just tell right. me if it's good or bad, right? right? Um, and then you have other individuals who are more like engineer minds and they want to know the data yep the data matters to them totally. and explaining the data to them in a way that is easy to understand so they can really know what is exactly going on with their hearing aids and so this particular individual had gain numbers just like we had showed a little bit earlier gain numbers on the left hearing aid that were not meeting the specifications and they they weren't that extreme off they're about 10 decibels below where they should be functioning and so uh, he was wearing them and he's like, he was swearing up and down that everything sounded great. But then when we went through the data, it's like, listen, I mean, we need to send this hearing aid in because it's not meeting specifications. Now you could tell us no, you could say, do not send it in. I wanna keep wearing the hearing aid even yeah. though it's not functioning the right way. Um, and we would do that because we follow person-centered care. So the patient's opinion matters totally. in this yeah. as long as they're making an educated decision. And, but once we showed the numbers on the screen, he was like, oh, yeah, I think we should send it in. Yeah. And so we ended up sending it in at that point. And you know what? He's going to be without that left hearing aid for about seven to 10 days or so. But when it comes back in, guess what else we're going to do? Test box measures. We're going to test it again. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to make sure that the data looks good. Because then when he comes back in to pick up the hearing aids, guess who's going to want to see that? He's going to want to yep. see that. He's going to want to look at it and be like, oh, yeah, look, the numbers are substantially better. And so when you're using something like Suite, we can easily toggle back and forth between yeah. here's the bad measure, here's the good measure, see that? And like, that's great. Super happy. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, audiologists, they talk about like how hard it is to make someone who's more of an analytical mind as a patient, how to make them happy. Yeah. Well, you make that type of individual happy by showing them data and explaining what that data means in the real world. And you get an extremely happy patient. Yeah, we have the ability to bring our patients into these processes. I think what a lot of providers run into is that if we were to take the hearing aids out of the room that we are in and go to the back and run all of these things and then come back and put them in front of them and say, okay, all good. Well, they have no idea what all we did back there, right? It's, it's, it's so important for our patients to be understanding of what best practice audiological care is and understanding the value in what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, because when it is out of sight, out of mind, there's, there, there may be these concerns of, I don't know why this testing is being done on my devices. Am I just getting charged for these additional things that are happening and, and I didn't even get to see the results of them and I'm just being told that everything's A-OK? -okay? You know, it's, it's this concern of, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. This Odo Suite, I love that it allows us to put everything up on the screen in front of the patient and really involve them in this process because this would be extremely boring for many people, like you said, but it's still so important to bring them into this process so that they understand why we're doing the things that we're doing. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with our ability to explain it better. And Otosuite allows us to explain this stuff in a very simple to understand way. Yeah. And the equipment makes me a better provider. Otosuite makes me a better provider because it is helping me treat my patients and helping them understand what's actually going on throughout this entire journey that they're on to treat their actual hearing loss. So sure. um, I, we couldn't do what we do inside the clinic without it. And that's Definitely why not. I love it so much. Yes, um, yes. But let's go ahead and Same. get into a review of everything that we talked today. Yeah. So the key points for the Oracle Hit Box, um, of course, starting with the objective measures of hearing aid function. Uh, this is just huge, just being able to use actual data points there. This also really helps us to differentiate between the need for a programming adjustment versus an actual repair of the device. And then, of course, you're big on proactive maintenance. This really allows us to do proactive diagnostic testing so that we can catch something early, catch problems early, and catch problems that the patient may not have even noticed, and then take all of the data from every single point of this entire journey and integrate it all into one spot with Otosuite so that we can reference any of their results at any time. 
All right, guys, that is about it for today's episode, but let's kind of look and see what we have coming up here and see where we actually came from. Um, but next uh, episode, we're going to be talking about hearing aid verification using real ear measurement and, of course, using the Oracle FreeFit real ear measurement system, so the probe microphone measurement system with them. And if you have not seen any of these previous episodes, make sure that you go back and check them out because this really is an entire journey that we are walking you through. We are putting the pieces of the puzzle together for you so you can understand what to expect when you're going in to receive high level best practice care but that is all the time that we have for today if you like this episode make sure that you click that like button if you are not yet subscribed to the channel go ahead and hit that subscribe button with notification bell so you do not miss any of our other episodes and we will see you for our sixth and final episode of this bonus series